Hello, uh, I've got a presentation for you. It's called Keyboards Suck But They Don't Have To um, and it's about QMK firmware. Um, before I begin, I will have to introduce myself. I put this slide in because otherwise I would forget to. Uh, my name's Michael Howard. Uh, I work in the public sector. I drink a lot of coffee and I am unreasonably interested in keyboards. Um, all kinds of keyboards. I am incredibly promiscuous when it comes to keyboards. Um, this is a keyboard. It sort of looks a bit like a toy from the 90s, um, but this is something I built and it runs QMK. It runs this firmware. Um, so specifically I'll be talking about uh, keyboards tonight that uh, have a particular kind of microcontroller in them that can run QMK. So it can be the case that a keyboard um, is, let me rephrase that. Um, generally these are like custom keyboards or mechanical keyboards, um, but just because a keyboard is custom or mechanical doesn't mean that it necessarily can run QMK and vice versa. Okay, here are some more pictures of keyboards. Um, I enjoy building them, it's fun, gives me a chance to solder things and play with pointy hot objects. Um, this is me lubricating switches down the bottom right. Um, it's incredibly painful and incredibly tedious. I would not recommend it to anyone. Here is a ridiculously large keyboard. Um, so just for reference, like a standard size keyboard, a full size keyboard, 100% is like roughly the size of this middle part here. So this is about 173% the size of a regular keyboard. Um, here's one I made for my girlfriend. She loves it. It's great. It's pink. Um, but yeah, this is what I do. Um, and at work, I'm currently using this monstrosity, which is um, a little vaguely masochistic keyboard I put together. Um, it's actually perfectly usable, um, but this is quite a way down the rabbit hole. Um, the reason I could use something like this is because of QMK. So this keyboard is completely programmable. Um, I can remap anything to anything. I can do things like macros. I have layers. Um, and I make use of the features of QMK so that this is actually usable. Um, I have it with me here tonight, so after the talk, you can have a play around with it. Um, yeah, again, it's ridiculous, I know, but it's fun. Okay, so moving on, why keyboards? Why, why bother with this incredibly niche hobby? Um, what is QMK? And then finally, what can I do with it? Okay, so why keyboards? Um, well, I use one all day, a lot. I say eight plus hours, but it's probably realistically more like 10 plus hours a day. Um, they're really useful input devices. They're probably the most powerful input devices we have just in general. Um, and we rely on them. And it's kind of weird that we don't think about them. Um, also, on that note, modern keyboard layouts are just weird and they kind of suck and they only really exist like completely by accident. And I don't really see any reason not to mess around with this. And it's nice to be able to mess around with layouts and uh, macros, etc., on the hardware because it means that you can take your cool keyboard to someone else's computer and use it. And you're not always relying on software at the OS level or on your text editor um, to do this fancy stuff for you. Um, and yeah, I, it basically for me it's about control as well. I like to have control and feel a sense of autonomy for this thing that I'm using day to day. Okay, first before we delve into uh, what QMK does, let's just think about why we would want to change things about this. Okay, first of all, 
this is a human hand. This is not designed for a human hand. Okay, if I take my hand and put it here, we have all these modifier keys in these little corners over here. To use those, I have to use my pinky. This is the weakest finger I have, and it has terrible range of motion. It has to go back and forth and curl up and down, and that's not what a pinky is good at. If I could choose to lose a finger, I would lose this one, because it's useless. Meanwhile, in the middle, we've got a space bar. In fact, that's all there is in the middle. If I have two hands on a keyboard, both my thumbs are on the space bar, but realistically, most people only use one thumb for the space bar. And also, what, what are we doing with the rest of this space? This is ridiculous. Your thumb is your strongest finger and has the widest range of motion, but we don't really use it for anything when we're using a keyboard. On top of that, there's QWERTY. I'm not going to talk about QWERTY. I think it's stupid, but also it's standardized now. Um, I don't use QWERTY. I've recently switched, which means I'm bad at typing on everything now. Um, <laughs> but I'm getting better. Um, that's only been a recent thing. You know what, QWERTY, I realize it's not perfect for the English language or any language that I know of, um, but it's standard. So let's ignore that. What the other main thing that I want to talk about here is the fact that this is very spread out. Um, so if you're typing and you want to have good typing form, you want to keep your fingers on the home row as much as possible. Um, and when you've got keys up here and here and over here, um, that becomes harder and harder to do. And the last thing I want to talk about is all of these modifier keys versus uh, these alphas over here. So on a keyboard, you're generally doing one of two things with a key. You're either tapping it or you're holding it. So for example, the shift key. The only thing I do with the shift key is hold it down. Likewise, the only thing I do with the G key is just tap it. What QMK allows you to do is it allows you to do different things based on whether something is tapped or held. So everything that previously was just held down can now be a key when you tap it. So for example, this shift key could be left parenthesis when you tap it. And this shift key could be right parenthesis when you tap it. And the same goes for these alphas over here. Maybe you think, you know what? I hate this shift key. It's too far away. All you need to do is go slash key becomes shift when I hold it down. Um, so you can do funky things like that. And this isn't perfect, but it can be made a lot better if you're able to control um, the firmware running behind your keyboard. OK, so what is QMK? Um, QMK has the ra uh, rather uh, ludicrous meaning of quantum mechanical keyboard. I don't really understand why. Um, I don't understand why it's quantum. It doesn't. I'm pretty sure there's a keyboard. There's not like a. It's not like a Schrodinger's input device. Um, they're also not always mechanical, but generally are. Um, anyway, ignoring the name, it's an amazing project, um, and it's an open source project that is centered around input devices. Um, so you can also have mice running this, or like MIDI controllers, which I think is really cool. Um, but primarily, I'm interested in keyboards. OK, features. So I touched on this earlier. Uh, we've got something called mod tap. So if you tap the key, it will send one thing. If you hold it down, it becomes something else. Um, this is crazy powerful. Like, if QMK, if QMK did this one thing, I think it would be still worth using, even if it was just this thing. So for example, your giant ugly spacebar could turn into control. So you don't have to turn your hand into a miniature gymnast to do a lot of key combinations. This actually makes Emacs much easier to use if you have a control key here. Um, I would definitely recommend it. Um, but you can do other crazy things, like you can have all of your modifier keys in your home row. So you could have like ASDF becomes super alt control shift when held in that order. And you can mirror that on the other side. 
and so you can really keep your hands in the center of a keyboard. Um, something like that is why a tiny keyboard like this is usable because you can get crazy economies um, when you're um, making the most use of each key. Uh, tap dance. So a similar vein, I guess, but in this case, basically what you do is you tap a key once for one key code, you tap it, tap it two times for another, or three times for another, or four times for another. I don't actually know if there's a hard limit on this. Um, I've never tried, um, but you probably wouldn't want to go above three anyway because you'd struggle to remember what they did. Um, the example I have here is uh, tap once for escape, uh, tap twice for caps lock. Um, it seems eminently reasonable to me. Um, caps lock is the devil. I don't even think caps lock should exist. I don't think that's a controversial opinion. I don't think anyone's going to fight me on that because caps lock is a completely useless key. If I could get rid of one key, it would be caps lock. And there are other keys that also shouldn't exist, but I have particular hatred for caps lock. Yeah, scroll lock's pretty bad. But there is some use for scroll lock in certain like spreadsheet editing applications, I think. Caps lock has no use anywhere, ever. No one needs caps lock. Uh, leader keys. So this one's fun. Basically, you can define a key as a leader key. And that means that you can do combinations of keys with that. So sort of a bit like how in Vim you can go like D2W, um, except sort of the sky is the limit with this. Um, if you're doing something like leader key EA to type your email address, you want to make sure that your leader key is something that wouldn't come before E and A. So like choosing M is a very bad idea as a leader key, because if you ever type the word meet or measure, then you, your email address would come out. Um, but if you chose something like Q, which is a great key, because it only comes before U, um, then you could use this all the time. Um, on a similar note, there's also, you can also make good use of um, key chording. So in the same way that you would play a chord on a piano, if you hold down you know, these two keys or these four keys at the same time, you can send a different key code. Okay, Unicode, uh, sort of. So you can basically, you can set up shortcuts for Unicode characters. So in a New Zealand context, you might want O with a macron. Um, so you have a function key and you go function plus O equals O with a macron. Now the reason I say sort of Unicode is because you can't send Unicode characters to your computer from a keyboard. It just doesn't work that way. Um, unfortunately, I really wish it did. Um, so basically, there's a very limited number of key codes that be can be sent to an OS. And that's because of the uh, USB HID protocol so basically, when you type a key on a keyboard, um, that key press will correspond to an HID scan code. And then that scan code will get turned into a key code and will be sent to the OS. Um, but that list of HID scan codes is really tiny. Um, and you can do things like you know, numbers and letters and punctuation and modifiers, et cetera. But you can't do. Unicode, um, anything. So when I say you can type Unicode, what I mean is um, QMK will simplify the process of sending the sequence of key presses needed for your OS to print a Unicode character. So this is OS dependent, and you will need to set that um, in your uh, rules file when you're setting this up. So for example, if you are on Linux, what you would be sending would be control shift U and then the Unicode hex. So in this case, 
function plus O would be control shift U and then 014D and then enter and then it would type that. Uh, mouse emulation. Um, I don't really have an example for this. I think you can imagine what mouse emulation means. Basically, you can whiz around your mouse using your keyboard, uh, click on things and scroll and move things, and it's fun. Okay. But how do we actually use this thing? Um, it's not as intimidating as it sounds. Um, you are playing around with firmware, but it's actually very simple. Um, basically, from all the user is doing when they're making a key map to flash on a keyboard, they are editing a file for a particular keyboard called keymap.c. Um, and you just have this big sort of key matrix here. Um, and there are defined key codes in QMK that you can just swap out at will, basically. Um, so they all, they're all they pretty intuitive. It's, you know, KC underscore Q is Q, KC underscore W is W, and you can see we've got QWERTY along here. We've got a number row along here, function row up here, um, and you can just go to town, basically. Um, Below it, what we have is a layer, um, and so you will need to define your key map and then all of the layers that correspond uh, with that key map. So if we have a main layout here on a keyboard, our first layer might be the layer that's activated when we press the function key. And then we could have multiple layers. So maybe we have another layer that's activated when I, I don't know, hold down the tab key or when I tap the shift key. Um, when you start to get more complicated, you'll need to do things like define macros and stuff. Um, but at a, at a simple level, like most of what you're doing, although it's a big scary C file, is just replacing these key codes. Okay, and there are GUI tools to do this as well. So um, this is QMK Configurator. It's just an online service which will also compile it for you. It will compile your key map for you as well, which is really nice. And then basically it will spit out a hex file and then that is what you can use to flash your keyboard. Um, and again, there's another program called QMK Toolbox, which is a GUI tool for flashing keyboards. Um, so none of this has to be um, via the command line. I do it that way and prefer to do it that way, but that's more because I'm used to it. And I think probably the majority of people just use graphical tools to program their keyboards because, I don't know, they're getting rid of caps lock or something. Um, but yeah, if you're going to do it on the command line, um, it's very easy. Just to like pip install um, QMK, QMK setup, and then you're there. And then at that point, you need to know what your keyboard is. So there are lots of different PCB designs out there and keyboards uh, and DIY kits that exist you'll need to know the name of what your keyboard is, and you'll also need to know the name of the key map that you've designed for it. Um, they all have default key maps, of course. Um, but you compile that with QMK compile, and then once you have hooked up your keyboard to your, um, to your laptop or PC, then all you need to do is put your keyboard into bootloader mode, um, which is generally about pressing a button on the back. Um, so if this was hooked up, I could type into a computer normally. If I press this button, it would go into bootloader mode, and then at that point, it would cease to type anything and would be awaiting um, 
the the binary that I was about to flash to it. Um, once that's ready, you just go QMK flash with the same details, your keyboard and key map, and then you're done. Um, and so often you'll think of a layout, flash it, try it out for a bit, make some changes, and then flash it again, maybe a couple more times, see what works for you, what doesn't. And then you have a key map that you love. Um, so yeah, really simple stuff, um, but really, really powerful. Um, and the more you think about it, the more you're like, ah, yeah, but maybe I don't even need this row, or I don't need this key, or why do I have a keyboard that has 200 keys when I could have one that has 36 or whatever? Or maybe you don't care, but you just want to get rid of caps lock. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, there's the content of my talk. It's been great to talk about keyboards. I am always keen to talk about them, building them more, programming them. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, I don't think those measures would fall in my favor, uh, <laughs> mostly because I spend a lot of time making keyboards and thinking about key maps, etc. So I think that would not reflect well on me. Um, it depends what you're doing, basically. Um, I think there are some contexts where you could really improve productivity um, or I think so I, I'm not really a gamer but I think there's a lot of gaming context where you could like really make use of macros and some of these features um, to really make those repetitive actions much more seamless um, but I would say that people who have like data entry jobs or who are doing a lot of I don't know even I mean I would say even editing code can be pretty manual if you're using a bad text editor. Um, and you could gain quite a lot. I mean, even things like having a key to type your email address is a small thing. But probably if you worked it out over the course of your lifetime, you've saved, I don't know, 10 minutes. That's 10 minutes you could spend doing other things, like looking at keyboards. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so there are keyboards that are sort of analog like that. Um, so if you have like a like a Hall effect switch where it's you're using magnets, then you can like, or even like if you're like measuring some sort of like change in capacitance or something, then you have it's not um, it's not on off. It's not binary. Um, QMK is not really designed for that. Um, yeah, yeah. So there are projects that um, that are focusing on stuff like that. I cannot, for the life of me, think of any names right now. They do exist. Um, the problem is, is that you then need to have. Yeah, it, QMK isn't designed for that, um, and. If you make, if you have this company that makes these awesome analog keyboards, um, you then have to go and make your own firmware and make your own configurator for people to use. Um, and I know there are some projects that have come quite far and are quite developed, but I would need to look them up. Yeah. Uh, I'm using Colmac or Colmac DH. So it's a slight variation of Colmac. Um, it's a bit like QWERTY, um, but different enough to really break your brain. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you so much for listening. If there's no more questions, I will finish up. All right, thank you.